Hello and welcome to the ESTRIP Live Journal Club for September 2023. My name is Ron Lowry. I'm coming to you live from Marder Pathology Brisbane, Australia on the traditional lands of the Jagera and Turrbal people. Today we have three recent interesting journal articles around the topic of vulva pathology that will be presented and discussed by three pathology trainees. Joining me today are my, is my co-moderator, Dr. Deborah Smith, and this is also the last session with Dr. Karen Talia who has been involved. So it's a big thank you to Dr. Karen Talia as she finishes her moderatorship in the Journal Club. Journal Club is global. You'll see that there is the Western Journal Club, which is based out of the US and the Eastern Hemisphere Journal Club with the Eastern Hemisphere coming out of Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia and India. We're usually on the third Thursday of every month at 12 p.m. This month is the exception. We really want to hear from early trainee, um, trainees and early career pathologists. We really encourage you to be part of the virtual sessions online with different presentation formats. You can participate in Journal Club and you can also participate in the interesting case presentations. We really want to give people the chance to discuss the scientific knowledge and critically assess the current literature. And that's why we offer these, these opportunities for presenting and mentoring. So if you're interested in presenting an interesting case you've been involved in, you can contact Dr. Andre Pinto or Dr. Rabuna Wadi based in the US and South Africa respectively. Journal Club is currently recruiting presenters for 2024. To be involved in the Western Hemisphere, contact Dr. Natalie Benet, whose email you can see on the screen, who's the coordinator, along with Dr. Rebecca Wolski and Ian Hagman. For the Eastern Hemisphere Journal Club based out of Australia, please contact me. For trainees involved in Journal Club, we try to offer a supportive and structured pathway to giving your presentation. So we provide you with an article that we've chosen we give you a framework for putting your presentation together. You're assigned a moderator like myself or my colleague, Deborah. We'll help you build your presentation, we'll help you rehearse, and we'll give you feedback to improve your performance and the understanding of your topic. We really like to make this a really positive experience for everybody. So Journal Club is only one of the educational experiences that's offered through ISTRIP. You can find the ISTRIP education site at istrip.ca. So there are slide seminars, there are webinars. There's also the ISTRIP podcast, which is available through SoundCloud. You can register for events through istrip.ca for free. ISTRIP members can also access, uh, access archived events. Membership is free for trainees. It's discounted if you're low, from a low or middle income country. I would really recommend joining. There's a great suite of educational activities um, available. Upcoming events through istrip.ca include the interesting case presentations. That's going to be in a week's time with three interesting cases. Also coming soon, dropping next week through SoundCloud will be another episode of the ISTRIP podcast, this time on high-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma. The podcasts really present a range of interesting topics and updates and are really worthwhile listening through. If you're a Spanish speaker, or you speak Portuguese, there's also the upcoming online course for, in Spanish and Portuguese based out of Latin America. And finally, something that is a little bit further off at the end of October, but probably worth marking in your diary now is the ISTRIP fully virtual annual meeting, which will have a series of lectures as well as a business meeting for members. So today's Journal Club is in a webinar format. So there's a Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions for our presenters, feel free to pose a question. We'll save all questions until the end of the third presentation. You'll also find there's a chat function and the chat will be at the edge of the screen. So if you've got any comments, any um, passing comments about cases you've been involved with or what, what you think about the topics we're presenting, or again, if you have a question for our presenters, you can also use the chat function and we'll monitor that during Journal Club Live. So onto our presenters today. We have three presenters, all from Australia this time round. So our first presenter will be Richie Jiang. Richie is a second year 
Anatomical Pathology Registrar at Dorovich Pathology, Western Health, Melbourne. Richie will be presenting a recent article from Modern Pathology, Classification of Vulvar Squamous Cell Carcinoma and Precursor Lesions by P16 and P53 Immunohistochemistry, Considerations, Caveats and an Algorithmic Approach. First author, Hang Yang, and senior author, Lin Huang. Our second speaker, will be Joan Wang. So Joan is a third year anatomical pathology registrar at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. She'll present, be presenting a paper from Human Pathology from 2022. Tumor budding activity is an independent prognostic factor in squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva. First author, Samay Zah. Second, uh, five, sorry, senior author, Dr. Fadare. And our third speaker for today will be Shepa. So Shilpa Atal. Shilpa is a final year anatomical pathology registrar at Australian Clinical Laboratories in Clayton in Melbourne. So our third Melbourne speaker for today. Shilpa will be presenting a paper from a recent edition of Modern Pathology, P53 Abnormal Fields of Dysplasia in Human Papilloma Virus Independent Vulva Squamous Cell Carcinoma Impacts Margins and Recurrence Risk. First author, Emily Thompson, and senior author again, Lin Huang. So I'm very happy to bring on our first speaker. So Richie, if you could please share your screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And um, as you mentioned, my name is Richie and for Journal Club today, I'll be presenting uh, the first article. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, authored by Lin Huang and Hang Yang et al., uh, the classification of vulvar squamous cell carcinoma and precursor lesions by P16 and P53 immunohistochemistry, as well as its considerations, caveats, and an algorithmic approach. So as we all know, vulvar squamous cell carcinoma, or vulvar SCC, uh, is currently categorized based on two broad etiology-based um, classifications, either HVB-associated or HVB-independent. Recently, um, studies have shown that HPV-independent tumors can be further subclassified into either P53 abnormal or P53 wild-type uh, tumors. And the reason that this delineation is important to make is that uh, there's evidence that P53 mutated or abnormal tumors show uh, significant prognostic differences to their wild-type counterparts, having higher local recurrence rates, as well as a significantly worse overall survival rate. And given the importance of separating vulva SCC into these three categories, uh, the authors wanted to find out how feasible is it to just use P16 and P53 immunohistochemistry alone to categorize uh, vulva SCC into these three categories. And to do so, the authors gathered 225 cases of vulva SCC from the hospital archives. They created a tissue microarray cores on which they performed um, immunohistochemistry, as well as a number of adjunctive tests. The first step they did was to classify each case as either P16 immunohistochemistry um, positive or negative. And then they performed P53 immunohistochemistry uh, and classified their staining pattern as either corresponding or complementary uh, to the P16 result or non-complementary to the P16 result. And what do these complementary results look like? So. If we had a P16 positive tumor, we'd expect P53 staining to either show a basal sparing or mid epithelial staining pattern or a null like staining pattern. Uh, these two are the HPV associated P53 um, staining patterns. If P16 was negative, we'd show the, uh, the P53 should show the other staining pattern, so specifically the scattered wild type pattern or one of the four muted patterns. And looking at the results from their study, uh, firstly, looking at the uh, 82 cases of, uh, that were P16 positive, we can see that 73 or 89% of them could be directly classified as a HPV associated tumor just using the two immunohistochemistry stains alone. There was one uh, small issue with the tissue microarrays that the authors encountered where 27 cases did show no staining uh, initially, um, and the authors couldn't tell whether this represented either a true null or mutational P53 pattern, which would be non-complementary to the P16 positivity, 
or a null like pattern, as mentioned um, before, that is associated with HPV and would be complementary. So the authors had to perform P53 once again on the whole tissue sections. Once they did that, they re uh, realized that 26 of them, in fact, were uh, basal sparing pattern, which is the complementary um, HPV associated uh, pattern. So 26 of these were classified as HPV associated. One case did remain null on the whole section, and the authors performed HPV-ish, which was negative, and the TP53 sequencing revealed a mutation. So this one case was classified as a HPV-independent and a P53 abnormal tumor. The next non-complementary pair that the uh, authors encountered was when P53 returned a positive or um, mutant stain, and the authors termed this phenomenon as a double positive. Uh, the authors performed HPV-ish and TP53 sequencing, which did not reveal any HPV infection and revealed, in fact, uh, all four of these cases had TP53 mutations. And these were also HPV-independent and P53 abnormal tumors. And the last non-complementary pair was when P53 showed a scattered wild-type pattern, which is not an expected HPV-associated P53 pattern. Uh, so the authors performed HPV-ish, which was in fact positive, and four, all four of these cases were um, categorized into the HPV-associated uh, vulva SCC group. And next, looking at the 143 P16 negative cases, actually 142 or greater than 99% of them had complementary P53 staining and could be directly classified as an HPV-independent tumor either P53 wild type or P53 abnormal, just using the enhanced chemistry alone. There was one case that had a P53 basal sparing staining pattern. Uh, as we know, this is associated with HPV. Um, however, P16 in this case was negative. So the authors performed HPV-ish, which, which was in fact positive, and the TP53 sequencing did not reveal a mutation. So this was in fact a HPV-associated tumor with the P16 being falsely negative. This table summarizes the results of, of the 225 cases, and we can see that over 95% of them could be directly classified into the three categories just using the IHC alone, with a small number of caveats. And moving on to the discussion of these, um, first, the first caveat that the authors uh, wanted to mention was the double positive P16 and the mutant P53 pattern. And they found that these were all HPV-ish negative, as well as TP53 mutated. And they inferred that when we encounter a double positive pattern, this most likely represents a P16 being falsely positive, and in fact, it is an HPV independent tumor. The next uh, caveat was when we encountered a null P53 pattern on immunohistochemistry chemistry with a positive P16 stain. And this came up in one of their cases. The authors uh, mentioned that this uh, combination did require HPV-ish and TP53 sequencing uh, as further tests to truly differentiate the difference between a null-like P53 pattern in an HPV-associated tumor or a true null P53 mutation um, pattern in a HPV-independent tumor. And thirdly, the findings from this study uh, reiterated the that P53 basal sparing or mid-epithelial pattern was seen only in HPV-associated tumors and did not change with TP53 mutations. And they actually uh, looked into this by performing TP53 gene sequencing on a small subset of their HPV-associated tumors and found that uh, two out of the 28 cases they tested for uh, did have a TP53 mutation. However, these both demonstrated P53 staining that was HPV associated, so either the basal sparing or the null like pattern. Next, the authors tried to investigate why some of the HPV independent and P53 abnormal tumors did have that false positive P16, resulting in a double positive expression. Um, and as we know, CDKN2A mutations can lead to P16 overexpression, as seen in other organ systems. Uh, however, when the authors performed the CDKN2A gene sequencing on their five, um, double positive cases, only two returned any mutations, which they did not think was significant enough to explain this phenomenon. 
Another hypothesis that they explored was a, a finding from another study where P53 deficiency led to P16 upregulation. However, if they uh, thought that this was consistently the case in uh, P53 mutated tumors, they would have expected to see much more than only the 3% of their cases having P16 uh, overexpression. So again, this uh, failed to explain this phenomenon. Next, the authors also assess the use of IHC uh, in classifying in situ lesions. And they did so by gathering an additional 87 cases of in situ vulvar lesions. They created tissue microarray cores once again from these and initially grouped them into um, the three categories based on morphology alone. So either DVIN, uh, HSIL or U UVIN and VARVIN, so these three categories. And then they used uh, the combination immunohistochemistry and found that, in fact, almost a third of what they initially thought was DVIN just on morphology alone were able to be reclassified into HSIL or VARVIN, and 7% of what they initially thought was HSIL uh, were actually, in fact, uh, DVIN. They did acknowledge that uh, using a tissue microarray for the uh, morphologic classification initially could potentially exaggerate these uh, proportions of misclassifications. However, they still concluded that a use of combination IHC is definitely useful in cases with difficult morphology, and especially when a case of uh, a diagnosis of DVIN is being considered. The authors mentioned that P53 immunohistochemistry supersedes morphology in the classification of HPV independent lesions as they reckon it better uh, reflects the molecular basis of these conditions. And it prevents the um, use of morphology that may have a lot of overlap with, in between each classification. And finally, the results from their study reaffirms that P16 IHC is a very robust marker of HPV infection with the high sensitivity and specificity. Although they found that HPV-ish was uh, more specific, um, P16 is a much more accessible tool and is still a very reliable marker for HPV. In terms of my appraisal of this article, I thought it was a very strong study as it uh, used a large cohort of a strong, um, large sample size. And there was a robust methodology with, with thorough analyses of each of the unexpected results. And they also incorporated specific uh, molecular techniques and ish techniques um, to uh, look at all of their results. Uh, some issues that I thought um, could arise in practice is with P53 interpretation. Um, as, they, as we've seen, there was a number of misinterpreted stains on their tissue microarray. Um, and we thought maybe if this was applied to biopsies in real life, whether um, a similar uh, pitfall could, could arise. Um, another issue was that HPV-ish and TP53 molecular sequencing is not necessarily a very readily accessible uh, technique um, or tools that many labs have access to. And, and finally, with only having five double positive cases uh, in their study, um, would they be able to truly say that all of these are in fact HPV independent tumors if they encountered more of these cases? Uh, so I'll conclude my um, presentation with some take home points, uh, acknowledging that the classification of vulva SCC as well as in situ vulva lesions can be very tricky. However, it is still important for prognostic stratification. P16 and P53 immunohistochemistry from the results of this study, we can see that readily, it readily classifies over 95% of uh, vulva SCC cases. And the authors recommend performing uh, the P16 and P53 combination uh, for vulva SCCs, as well as difficult insight lesions with an algorithm um, that they have provided, which I've copied onto my screen. And thanks so much for everyone's attention. Thank you very much, Richie, for a summary of a long article that's got quite a lot of information in the process, as well as a fairly complicated diagnostic algorithm at the end. So we'll hold on our questions till the end. So our next speaker will be Joan. So Joan, if you could please share your screen. Um, yep. Thank you, Joan, looks good. 
Great, thank you. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Joan. I'm one of the registrars at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. Um, thank you very much for having me present today. Um, I know, do I apologize? I don't have a camera on my computer, so apologies for that. Um, today I am presenting this article. Tumor budding activity is an independent prognostic factor in squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva. Um, so this was done by Zah and um, Fadari et al, who are based out of the University of California, San Diego, and it was published in August of last year. So study design and a bit of background. So we know that the majority of vulva malignancies are squamous cell carcinomas. The death rate has basically remained stable over the last 50 years, despite all of our advances in understanding and management. And therefore, prognostication and being able to optimise management for these patients remains a somewhat elusive goal. To this end, uh, various morphological features such as um, tumor differentiation, ATPR, mitotic index, um, and patterns of invasion. They've all been studied to see whether they can help stratify patients into their risk of lymph node metastasis, recurrence, or death. However, most of these studies have found these features are not associated with survival. So in this article, we look at another morphologic feature, tumor budding. The question we want to answer is, what is the prognostic value of tumor budding activity, or TBA, in vulvar squamous cell carcinoma? Um, we know that tumor budding correlates to a phenotype with increased invasiveness and has been found to be an adverse prognostic factor in other carcinomas, um, including of the gynecological tract. Sorry, methods. All consecutive cases of primary invasive VSCC treated by surgical resection at this institution between 2000 and 2020 were identified. Patients who received new adjuvant treatment or who were lost to follow up were excluded, which left 82 patients. In terms of histologic evaluation, pathologists were blinded. Um, and a tumour bud was defined as a cluster of less than five neoplastic cells that appeared to be detached from the main tumoral mass in the peritumoral stroma. Um, so this is a nice example of that. Um, it's actually uh, from an endometrial carcinoma, but it um, nicely illustrates these single neoplastic cells and small clusters less than five cells infiltrating into the stroma. Also, the area with the highest tumor budding was used to assign TBA. So there are several ways to assess tumor budding and the authors used this method. Uh, so tumor budding was assessed in 10 high power fields and then classified into one of three groups, either no budding, low budding, if there were one to 14 foci of tumor budding in those 10 high power fields, or high budding if there were 15 or more foci. Um, and then a variety of tumoral morphological parameters were assigned for each case, including whether or not there was keratinization, basaloid morphology, um, PNI, LVI, um, the grade, and also the depth of invasion. They also performed P16 and P53. These are just some uh, examples of the cases that they had. So these are examples of um, cases with no budding, um, of low budding, if there were one to 14 foci in the 10 high power fields, and high budding um, uh, in these cases where there were 15 or more foci in 10 high power fields. Statistical analysis was performed using the various methods uh, listed here. So on to results. This is a table of the clinico-pathological characteristics of the cases. Um, and I'd just like to highlight that the mean follow-up time was 50.6 months or just over four years. Uh, tumor recurrence occurred in 40% of patients and 26% of patients died during follow-up. This is a table summarizing the association of all of those features with overall 
survival um, or OS and disease-free survival DFS. So if we look at um, the budding category, it's divided up into the three categories of no budding with zero buds, low budding, less than 15, and high budding, 15 or more. Um, so the no budding and the high budding groups had a similar number of cases at 23 and 22, um, but the biggest group was the low budding, which had 37 cases um, or 45% of the total cases. So if we just zoom in on this highlighted square, the mean overall survival for the no budding group was 142.5 months. And then it was slightly lower for the low budding group at 130.2, but goes down to 34.1 uh, for high tumor budding. Uh, mean disease-free survival follows a similar trend. So essentially, high tumor budding activity was significantly associated with shortened overall survival. Um, so if we look at the diagrams, again, uh, as time goes on in months, the no budding and the low budding groups have a much better survival than high budding in red. Also, um, this was shown to be independent of FIGO stage, HPV status and P53 pattern on multivariate analysis. High budding was also significantly associated with these features. Um, so more advanced age, higher stage, lymph node metastasis, higher depths of stromal invasion, um, LVI and PNI, and also with a P53 mutant status. Budding activity was not um, correlated with histologic grade or histotype. Tumors with low budding activity did not show a statistically significant difference in survival when compared to no budding activity. So really the split is between high tumor budding versus all other groups. And finally, um, with regards to HPV and P53, so more than half were HPV associated, um, but high TBA was only seen in five of the 47 HPV cases. However, um, this small subset seemed to have a worse outcome come with the mean overall survival of 16.8 months compared to 142.8 months for the rest of the HPV cohort. For P53, there was a significant correlation between P53 and high TBA. Out of the 32 cases of um, that were P53 mutant, 17 had high TBA. And again, this subset seemed to have a worse outcome with mean OS of 37.5 months compared to the P53 mutant cases that had low or no budding, um, which had a mean of 63.3 months. So on to discussion. This is the historical context for the study. Um, so only sporadic studies have really explored the concept of patterns of invasion. Um, and for a long time, this sort of middle chunk of time here, the studies have generally classified it into two or three groups, either a pushing blunt pattern or an infiltrative spray-like pattern. The prognostic significance of this classification is a bit unclear though, as reported results have been quite conflicting. And this may also be because of differences in um, definitions and interpretations of these patterns across different studies. So a simple classification into infiltrative and non-infiltrative um, is probably not the ideal um, framework to use in terms of prognostic frameworks. Should we move into studying the these patterns under a tumor budding framework instead, um, especially where the definitions are a little bit more well accepted. So what is the significance of tumor budding? This study shows that the clinical significance is best established at high tumor budding versus all others, um, including low and no budding. 
High budding is a poor prognostic factor that is independent of FIGO stage, HPV and P53 status. And they found that most tumours with a high budding had a P53 mutant status. So as mentioned before, um, studying pattern of invasion under a tumour budding framework could potentially provide greater clarity than historical systems. Being able to better prognosticate um, also influences management. Uh, for example, um, clinical decision trees as to whether or not to perform groin lymphadenectomies. The study highlights the importance for pathologists to correctly assess TBA and also um, adds to the body of evidence for epithelial mesenchymal transition, which is the process of epithelial cells um, acquiring a mesenchymal phenotype and then being able to migrate and invade. Um, strengths and weaknesses of the study. Um, so strengths included uh, being able to use two decades decades worth of cases and a relatively lengthy follow-up time that um, allowed for the endpoints to occur. The multivariate analysis that was performed also means that they accounted for other variables associated with prognosis. Um, and the single institution was both um, a strength and a weakness uh, in terms of um, it minimised the effect of differing treatment protocols, um, but uh, only reflects the one institution. Um, so other potential issues, um, there were only 82 cases, um, and it's uh, also a study based out of the US, um, so may not be entirely applicable to different um, populations around the world, uh, especially with differences in HPV vaccination rates and different healthcare systems. Um, the study did not account for or explain any inter-observer variability for assessing TBA uh, and if multiple pathologists reviewed the slides and what their experience in gynae path was. Also, the three categories for defining TBA were originally proposed for cervical SEC, so its applicability to vulva SECs um, is still a little bit unknown. Um, applications in clinical practice um, slash some take home uh, points. Um, so reporting high tumor budding would be important. And for P53 mutant tumors in particular, looking for high tumor budding. If high tumor budding is seen, it may also be a clue to look for the other things that it's associated with, such as lymph node metastasis, higher depths of stromal invasion, LVI, and p and This is also a space for ongoing research, including larger multi-institutional and international cohorts to help validate these findings. Um, finding an optimal cutoff in terms of defining TBA and defining categories of TBA. And in future, um, potentially being able to incorporate it into synoptic reporting. Uh, these were my references. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Joan. And that's a, quite a contrasting paper based on morphology as opposed to immunohistochemistry as Richie's presented in our first paper. And as Shilpa will now present in our third paper. So Shilpa, if you could please share your screen. Sure. Hello everyone, thank you. thank you Rohan. Greetings from down under uh, for those attending from the Northern Hemisphere. My name is Shilpa Aital. I'm a final year trainee of AP Pathology in Australian Clinical Labs, Australia. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present this article today. So this is a research article published in Modern Pathology this year, that is in February, 2023 and it is from the volume 36, issue two. The title is P53 Abnormal Fields of Dysplasia in Human Papilloma Virus Independent Vulvar Squamous Cell Carcinoma Impacts Margins and Recurrence Risk. The study is from Vancouver General Hospital, British Columbia, Canada, 
authors Emily Thompson and Lynn Huang are uh, um, from the same University of British Columbia and Vancouver General Hospital, many of them are. This author group has also brought about several other articles on female genital system and vulvar pathology in particular. They are uh, well recognized authors in this field. Now, a bit of introduction. Um, Richie has already spoken about um, the squamous cell carcinomas in Evan Joan. So, squamous cell carcinoma is a rare disease in the vulva, um, incidence of about 2.6 per 100,000 women in um, per year in US. Uh, from the previous presentation, as Richie said, we already know that there are two pathways to the vulvar uh, squamous cell carcinomas. One is the HPV associated, the other is the HPV independent. The HPV independent again has P53 mutated pathway and a wild type pathway. Now, um, there are several recent studies which have um, brought out that TP53 mutated HPV independent vulva squamous cell carcinoma have a higher rates of recurrence and a poor survival, overall survival as compared with um, the HPV associated and also the other counterpart that is the P53 wild type. So what are the impacts on morbidity and mortality? A systematic review of uh, around 22 studies showed that the disease recurrence affects the mortality and morbidity of the patients with an annual recurrence of 4%. And in whom it recurs, the second recurrence is up to 72%, which is, which is quite large, and a third recurrence rate is also high. Um, and one can only imagine the magnitude of physical and psychosocial um, morbidities associated with these repeat surgeries. Now, in um, the first presentation, which we already discussed this, and um, these, uh, the same cohort of authors, um, they also did the P53 IHC pattern correlation to the TP53 mutation status. And uh, they did have a correlation of more than 93%. And this correlation has been used as a stepping stone for this particular study. Um, the authors of this article found that the abnormal regions of staining um, of by the P53, um, which they termed as P53 abnormal fields of dysplasia, was extending beyond the um, vulval squamous cell carcinoma, even the differentiated win, into the areas which were interpreted as atypical lichen sclerosis or even uh, which looked normal morphologically. Um, coming to the study design, um, the authors sought the answers to these questions. Could the mutation associated P53 IHC pattern in the surrounding skin be clinically significant? And um, if it's significant, is it extending to the margin? And also, could it possibly explain the recurrence rates? If so, then what is the frequency of this abnormal IHC pattern in the skin surrounding the squamous cell carcinoma? And what is the frequency of it extending to the resection margins? And is this the finding associated with increased risk of local recurrence? So this was a retrospective single institutional study, valvectomy specimens from institutional archives of Vancouver General Hospital was collected between 1996 and 2017. The inclusion criteria was um, were all those cases of HPV independent um, squamous cell carcinomas, which were P16 IHC negative and P53 IHC mutation pattern. Um, also the inclusion criteria was that the they had negative margins for the differentiated win and squamous cell carcinoma in the original report. And the assessment was done by three specialist gynecological um, pathologist and two gynecological pathology research fellows. They reviewed the H and E slides from all these cases and selected blocks with the closest approach of squamous cell carcinoma to the peripheral margin, one to two blocks per case, and reassessed the margin using P53 IHC. Um, P53 and P16 IHCs were done on the whole sections. P16 IHC was scored according to the last criteria and British Association of Gynecological Pathologist criteria. P53 was scored by the pattern-based approach, which was previously validated by the same group, the one which Richie presented. 
TP53 sequencing was done by selected lesions of int on the selected lesions of interest and also on areas of P53 abnormal staining at the margin um, and matched invasive tumor. And they were analyzed by using next gen sequencing. Um, several clinical pathological data and our data were conducted, which I'll be discussing later. And chi squared test was used to assess the association of the P53 abnormal IHC at the margin and local recurrence at two years. And alpha of point less than 0 0.05 was considered statistically significant. Um, this is the table of clinical pathological characteristics of the evaluated cohort. Um, of note, total number of cases was 73 and age of presentation was 75 years. Um, about 25% of the cases had lymphovascular invasion. Um, local recurrence was seen in 25% of the cases. Lichen sclerosis was associated in 58% of the cases, and the tumor was a stage 1B in 82% of the cases. Majority of them were organ-confined diseases with a size less than 2 centimeters and stromal invasion of um, more than 1 millimeter. Now, this is an interesting diagram, um, which makes one wonder if uh, how many differentiated wins have been missed so out of the 73 cases, 56 had um, in situ lesions by morphology or by P53, out of which 21 of the in situ lesions were only detected after the use of P53 IHC. And more concerning is that um, 11 of these missed cases had um, in situ lesions at the margin. Out of the 35 in situ lesions which were recognized in the original report, uh, four of them were present at the margin, which was also an unexpected finding and was detected only after P53 um, I had seen. So summarizing the results um, of this study, um, 35 documented cases of differentiated wins, over which 21 additional P53 abnormal in situ neoplasia were identified, that is a 29%, and 11 of them extended to the margin four extended to, to the margin, which were in the original report, but they extended to the margin on P53 IHC. And also of importance is the recurrence at two years. Um, the P53 abnormal in situ lesion at the margin um, had a higher recurrence rate of 71.4%, um, which is statistically quite significant. Um, this is a good um, h and &E section of um, how dif to, to demonstrate how difficult it is to diagnose the D-win and um, where it looks near normal. Um, but on the other hand, the P53 is um, parabasal overexpression extending to the margin there. And this is another case from the same um, cohort only showing a bit of hyperkeratosis and parakeratosis, but not much of atypia in terms of um, the cells. And that's extending um, to the margins and the parabasal overexpression, which is an abnormal expression of P53 is extending to the margin in this. Um, this was confirmed by P53 mutation using next gen sequencing. This is another um, picture of how the valval SCC has a D win surrounding it, and then there is um, abnormal P53 pattern going all the way to the uh, margin. Uh, so this this um, is a little convincing that this is D win with acanthosis and ATP of the cells, um, more eosinophilia of the um, squamous cells, parakeratosis and hypokeratosis. But as we go uh, away from the D-win, it's really hard morphologically to identify these lesions. However, the P53 immunostain is pretty abnormal with parabasal overexpression in all these lesions right to the edge of the margin. So coming to the discussion, um, the authors used P53 stain to identify these P53 abnormal fields of dysplasia surrounding the squamous cell carcinoma. In about 27%, they found the 
P53 abnormal field of dysplasia around the squamous cell carcinoma and in about 21% reaching the margin. And they also found that uh, there was a threefold risk of recurrence um, with these. So there are a few uh, relevant previous studies. Um, in 2015, Sing et al., they studied um, detailed mapping of differentiated win fields by using P53 IHC stain. This was one of the pioneer study to identify the P53 um, precursor lesions with abnormal staining. And they also recognized that these lesions were being underdetected and extent and margin of involvement was underestimated. This study, the current study by Emily Thompson, is also an extension of the study. Um, while they did detailed mapping of um, all the DWIN fields, the study was only of 14 specimens from 10 patients, and they did not correlate with the P53 IHC, um, the P53 IHC pattern with the mutational analysis. But it was uh, quite a good study in that it did a detailed mapping. And several other studies also identified the difficulty in defining a threshold for the differentiated win, which these authors as uh, appreciated as well, that it is difficult to identify and um, keep a threshold for a differentiated win on histology alone. Um, so these authors have re-emphasized that um, P53 abnormal lesions can be very subtle morphologically, and um, they do strongly recommend that um, P53 IHC be used for detection and margin assessment. The clinical implication being um, you could do a targeted surgical removal of P53 abnormal fields of dysplasia to reduce the local recurrence rate, and this would uh, improve the patient outcome. Uh, coming to the strengths or areas of improvement, strengths as um, uh, as as explained by the authors themselves, it's a good sample size, and it backs previous findings of P53 abnormal lesions, which can be easily missed. And um, it also emphasizes the need for IHC for better recognition and margin resection. Um, I think that this is quite a compelling article. Um, they are well recognized authors. And many of them are uh, subspecialist gynecological pathologists with multiple research papers. And it is it has a good strength um, of cohort. Uh, although it's not a new um, finding, um, the study explains the terminology better, the P53 fields of dysplasia, though the terminology is a bit confusing. It's been explained well. The study is backed by TP53 sequencing, um, making it a robust study, and sufficient emphasis has been given for P53 IHC. And also, the cost of uh, performing IHC is um, it's quite nominal, and the availability is also good. Hence, um, it is a feasible um, test to do. Areas for improvement, um, it's a retrospective single institutional study, which in itself is a bit of a limitation. And um, the full mapping of P53 was not done um, by the study. Um, so there could have been underestimation of margin involvement. How thoroughly should the margin be sampled and how many sections um, would be needed to capture an occult dysplasia was not really explained well. Uh, title is not very self-explanatory. It is a little difficult to comprehend. Um, I had to go through twice to actually understand what they're saying. And this is also, um, it requires a larger validation study to actually shift the clinical practice for everyone to start using P53 at the margins. And also it's a debatable terminology. Um, the author suggests that this could be like a soil or a substrate for a dysplastic lesion, but um, the outcome of the study suggests that this could be even a dysplastic lesion since the recurrence rate is almost the same as the d -win. And also, how do we report these um, lesions? Do we just call them P53 abnormal lesions in the margin and how would you explain it to the clinician? These are a few questions to ponder. Um, but 
having said that, this is a very good study and um, definitely there is a take home message that um, like in other fields of pathology, a molecularly defined approach would be really good uh, with P53I HC staining in uh, HPV independent squamous cell carcinoma, it will definitely help us to recognize morphologically subtle in situ lesions, especially at the margins. And also this would significantly change the recurrence rates and patient outcome. So uh, thank you everyone for your patient listening and um, thank you Rohan and Deborah for uh, mentoring this presentation. This photo is from Rotorua, New Zealand, and it, it's just a uh, Pohutu geyser, uh, which spews um, boiling hot water up to 30 feet, and it's quite wonderful to see it. Thank you. Thank you, Shilpa, for a great presentation, and also for making us all want to go on holiday now. So thank you to all our three speakers. So I'll ask um, Richie to turn his camera back on, and also my colleague and co-moderator, Dr. Deborah Smith. And we might just uh, have a few questions for our presenters about some of their some of their articles. So, Richie, if I ask you first, so as pathologists, we spend a lot of time looking down microscopes as a trainee. You've probably spent a lot of time trying to assess nuclear characteristics and all these subtle things that pathologists we believe that we can see. Your paper is very much the death of morphology. It's, it, should I just be doing a P53 and a P16 on every vulvar biopsy and not even bothering with a H&E? Or do you think there are cases where your morphology is still going to be important? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, so the recommendation from the study in terms of uh, vulva SCCs is um, the classification uh, using the immunohistochemistry, um, well, using the immun immunohistochemistry can, can um, seem to really speed up your the process of classification. Um, however, we I guess if we have like really small samples, um, there's the potential pitfall for misinterpreting the stain. So, in those instances, perhaps morphology would um, be be better relied upon. So, and you talked about. Um, the small number of cases where you might need sequencing or you might need HPV-ish for final, final classification. Do you have access to those in your laboratory or do you think you'd have to fall back on a bit of morphology for those samples? Yeah, that's right. Um, our lab doesn't have either of those techniques. Um, so the only thing we could rely on is the, yeah, the IHC and then back to morphology. So, so Shilpa, your, your paper also was a little bit um, damning of morphological analysis as well. I think, as you said, when you walk through the algorithm, that it really is the kind of diagram that fills every pathologist with dread as you think about how many P53 abnormal lesions I have not recognized. Um, does, has this paper changed how you look, will, will be looking at vulva specimens going forward? Yeah, I think so. Um, because when they talk about um, P53 I had C staining, um, on, on every vulval squamous cell carcinoma. I do agree with them um, because the recurrence rate and that too, the vulval area is, is um, such a small area and you would think about um, uh, getting it right the first time. And probably um, the clinicians also will be interested in knowing that they've got everything out. And uh, I would think that, um, yeah, doing the P53 immunohistochemistry, if that helps us, then that would be the right way to go. Mm -hmm. um, you, you made some really interesting points at the end about that leap we all, that something like this will take from being a research paper with really interesting and rel potentially relevant findings to how this becomes part of our everyday practice. And you talked about larger studies to validate this, you know, multiple institutions, you have to make sure it's really robust in practice. But one of your other points was just words. As pathologists, we have to use words, we have to write reports. So how would you write a report for a very subtle P53 abnormal lesion going to a margin? What kind of words would you use? So I think I would put a, uh, a comment at the bottom saying, um, 
this p53 abnormal field of dysplasia is known to have a recurrence a higher recurrence rate and um a clinical um correlation is required and probably a more um frequent uh, you know surveillance is required okay. i think the i think sometimes this pathologist is very easier for us to look at studies like this and say that, as you say, there's a, a about a three times risk of recurrence that's based on small numbers, but was still reasonably statistically robust. Um, and that therefore there should be wider excision. But if you think back about your paper, the average age of those patients was 75, 75. I think. Yes. And, and you know, vulvar surgery has big consequences. So I think it's going to be really probably create some clinical dilemmas as this comes out into the workplace where you're starting to put this in reports. There might be some very difficult decisions made about surgery in a difficult location and sometimes patients that aren't that well. So it's going to be really interesting to see the significance that clinicians attach as this data becomes better known. Yeah. So, so, I so Joan. Add, but I think that, oh, oh sorry. I was going to say, no, I think please, the don't. other thing that I'm thinking about is the uh, Shilpa's paper is SEC is going to a margin. But what I think about is when I get these as small marks, these are a little look into the TMA, and you still have that morphology that's not particularly good, but you've got your P53 that looks off. And, you know, what do you advise the clinician then? So there's a world of pain with multiple biopsy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, I'm afraid this is your future, guys. It's a world of pain. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen to Dr. Smith. So, Joan, a question for you. So your paper was a little bit different because it relied on very old fashioned morphological skills, um, yes. only some IHC backup, but produced some really interesting results. Um, you talked a little bit about this is one paper, it's a single institutional study. Um, what would you, how would you take this down a pathway to make this something that is demonstrably robust and that would be standardized and reproducible? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so I think um, part of it would be um, a sort of standardised definition. I think part of uh, the issues historically have been varying um, definitions and interpretations of patterns of invasion. So um, I think further um, studies into this would require, um, I guess, a standard definition and, um, yeah, I guess multi-institutional and international cohorts as well to help um, make those findings more robust. Um, and uh, I guess uh, also looking into um, into observer variability as well, um, I guess that uh, is something that hasn't really been explored. Um, um, and I guess how reliable um, different pathologists' uh, interpretation of it is. Um, when you talk through your data, the really interesting point was that HPV positive group who had tumour budding, who did very badly, they really stood yes. out. So yeah, I suppose really. this, yeah. And as you said, you, you, there's a whole range of different prognostic factors that clinicians may use to determine future further treatment for individual patients. But do you think maybe this might be something that is going to have relevance in say, some groups like that? So say if you're already a P53 deeply invasive, a P53 mutant deeply invasive carcinoma, it's probably not gonna matter so much, but maybe in some of those early cancers perhaps, or the HPV dependent cancers with budding, that might be a real targeted kind of area? Yeah, I think so, that's a good point. Um... They had a dramatically different um, mean overall survival compared to the other group. Um, so yeah, I, de I definitely think that the subtleties uh, of that could be drawn out and potentially affect um, management decisions. So now, Chilpa, there's actually a question that has come in through the Q&A from one of the attendees, So, which is a, actually an interesting question, and I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer it. Did the study do P53 IHC on non-neoplastic processes known to sometimes lead to DVIN, i.e. lichen sclerosis? Um, so in this study, the P53 was done on selected areas. Yes, they did do on um, areas where it looked. They did do it on selected areas where um, even atypical lichen sclerosis 
um like um noted by the um person who is asking the question yeah it it was done on uh, those selected areas but it was not a complete mapping yeah mm -hmm. and, and i think you, your your study is only on cases with a diagnosis of yes. cancer and in situ lesion so it's there were no independent no, yeah yeah, so the, there were no no specimens that only had a diagnosis of lichen sclerosis. It was very yes. much these are very it was a targeted study around neoplastic yes. and pre neoplastic lesions only. Yeah. So, thank you for your question. So whoever asked the question, um, Deborah, I'll throw the floor to you. Well, actually, I was just going to tell you time is up. So oh. yeah. Well, just, just before we go, I'd like to thank our three presenters. We'd like to put out a call for presenters for 2024. Um, we'll be filling up our timetable. So if you've enjoyed today and found it useful, please um, give send me an email. My email address is in the presentation or just through ISTRIP. The other exciting thing we do have for 2024 is we do have two new moderators coming on board. And our two, two new moderators will be based in Singapore. So we welcome on board Dr. Soraya Mansur Mons and Dr. Yao Yan Cheng, both at KK Women's and Children's Hospital Singapore. So we're very, very much looking forward to um, working with Sorcia and Yen, and also increasing numbers of presenters we see from Southeast Asia and beyond. So, but really, if you're listening and you're interested, please um, give us an email. We would love to have you present next year. Beyond that, I. I'd like to thank our presenters again and reminder that um, the next month's journal club from November will be endometrium, will be present, sorry, if for October, will be endometrium and will be presented from the Western Hemisphere. So thank you. <laughs>